Welcome back to the Redacted Culture Cast, where we talk about the intellectual ideas that have to do with violence, use of force, and how we think about morality in a sort of gray area world. Now, my guest today is somebody that I've looked forward to have a conversation with before. Um, we've brought you up on the show before some of the arguments that you've made, which can't be the first time because you're a little bit of a public intellectual at this time. Uh, so, Mr. James Lindsay, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, um, I don't know that being called a public intellectual is a bragging point, but uh, <laughs> for those of you that know the history, the public intellectuals were often the ones that were co-opted to uh, drive communism in the various uh, countries that got taken over by that. But at any rate, that's not me. I'm the opposite of that. I am probably, I mean, I, I hate to say things like this, but I'm probably the or a leading expert in uh, communism and its evolution through the past 100 years, uh, particularly the Western variant of Marxism and how it de uh, developed and contextualized itself to attack uh, Western and particularly American systems. Um, I've written a number of books. I just had one come out last week called The Queering of the American Child, talking about the infiltration of queer theory, which is a Marxist theory of sexuality, uh, primarily into schools. Um, so I guess, you know, half a dozen other books or whatever. Cynical Theories was very famous that outlined the postmodern influence on these lines of thought. Race Marxism exposes critical race theory for what it is, which is race Marxism. And the Marxification of education shows how they uh, were able to steal education uh, and undermine its purposes. Uh, so those are a handful of the books that I've published. But the Queering of the American Child, or Queering book as I call it, is the one I'm pushing lately. Um, I travel around the country and world speaking on this issue, um, typically a handful to a dozen or more times a month somewhere that's not home. So I get around and am trying to basically raise a nation to fight back against what's happening around them. Yeah, so one of the reasons that my wife and I discussed on why I was going to leave some of the more active um, pointy end of the stick uh, work was because I wanted to be home more and listening to you talk about that like being gone all the time is 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 a is certainly a a different way of life so <clears throat> but hey the um I, before we get started if anyone or for those who are listening if you want to support the show you can head over to redactedllc.com or you can follow us on locals at redactedculture.locals.com where we do our conversation but all that self promotion aside so the way that you're describing it, and I want, and I want to, one of the things that I've been wanting to have a conversation with you about is, is comes from a little bit of how I think about or how we think about operations. Now this is going to be special operations. You think a bunch of rangers are going to go hit a target building. Now there's multiple things that go on before that. You might think about the skills of the individual, learning how to use a radio, throw a hand grenade, kind of Call of Duty esque level skill sets and then it moves up to tactics which is a combination of skills that make uh a, an objective achievable and then you move up to strategy and but then you keep going up this kind of line and one of the challenges that america faced in in most of its recent conflicts is it seems like the top level or you could say the bottom level the foundation wasn't there and in the example of afghanistan was what's the point like where why are we really here if there was a reason it wasn't communicated to many of the people who were there and if there wasn't a reason, we did a really good job obscuring that. And the challenge with something like I, what I what I witness on the ground and I witness in conversations with people is the problem and the challenge with Marxism and postmodernism and some of these words that sometimes make people famous or sometimes become not necessarily the whipping boy on a college campus, but a target of ire is we can be frustrated about it. We can articulate why it's wrong, but there's nothing that can be done about it. It just it just goes. You have an art. You have an argument. You have an issue with, you know, like Marxism. We can describe why it's wrong, why it's morally wrong, why it's destructive. But then we don't really have a tool in the toolbox to handle that. And that's do you do you how do you handle that dilemma between sort of almost like a rote utilitarianism of well we've determined it's bad how do we make it work which is not philosophical utilitarianism but how do you deal with those problems well i'll point out the way you just said actually it is that marxism actually does derive off of a utilitarian ethic if you read their definition of truth and this is a total tangent from what you asked but it's interesting uh they actually have 
a, a glossary on their their famous repository on the internet called marxists.org so marxist plural marxists hard to say and get it across .org has an encyclopedia of marxist terminology which turns out to be like people are like james you're the rosetta stone of marxism no i just really read their happily published rosetta stone that they put out for themselves and they explain that truth can be that that, that our relationship to truth can take a number of forms and uh, they say that all truth is relative, but then they start by saying that, they're, you know, well, here's a school of thought. It's called empiricism. That which can be demonstrated by experiment is true. And here's a school of thought called rationality. And that, that which is logically uh, sound and valid is true. And here's a school of thought, utilitarianism, which is, or pragmatism, that which works is true. And then they say, well, the Marxist theory of truth is just like the last one. It's just like the pragmatic definition of truth. That which works must be true, except that the criterion of whether or not it works is whether or not it installs Marxist theory into power. And so Marxism is true when what it does is gives itself more power. That is actually the way that they think about truth. So it's actually important to realize that but this is actually kind of related to how I deal with it. Now, I like that you've broken this down into this kind of hierarchical taxonomy of, you know, skills versus tactics versus strategy versus ideology, um, kind of in this, and there's probably some steps in between, but just to kind of give a picture of what we're talking about from 30,000 feet, because they have to be dealt with each in their own domain. So for the ideology, the, the strategy actually is literally to, uh, to identify it correctly. Um, if we know that Marxism is bad, those of us who oppose Marxism and know that it's going to have bad results benefit merely by exposing that this is what we're dealing with. But I think it goes deeper than that because I think the reason that we've had so much calamity, death, and destruction for 150 years as a result of Marxism is because we've consistently misidentified it. We take it as an economic theory or a political theory or, or a social theory, which it's none of those. It's 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 a religion. It's it's a theology. And in fact, it's an incredibly intolerant theology that believes that it has unique an entitlement to a unique purchase on what it means to be human. And therefore, it gives itself total license to do whatever it needs to do. In other words, the means will always justify the ends if the ends are to install Marxism, which, of course, makes it even more destructive. It operates like a cult. It causes trauma to people, it causes them to suffer, and then it frames and contextualizes the trauma so that the cult is the apparent answer. Um, they create what are, I mean, I could get into technical bullcrap, but they create what are called affordance traps to do that. So now we're getting kind of more into tactics. Affordance traps are, it's either this or it's that. They give you a limited number, they afford you a limited number of options. So either we're gonna have a woke nightmare, or we're going to have a Christian nationalist fascist reaction. And they give you those two options as though there aren't a million others in between. That's called an affordance trap. And so we're either going to have socialism or, you know, crony capitalism that destroys everything. This is the kind of, we're either going to have a communist super state that runs the entire world through global cooperation headquartered in the United Nations, or we're going to have an environmental catastrophe that kills most of the planet. These, this is, this is, this is how they operate. And exposing the nature of these things actually undermines it. There was a, and I, I hate when I can't remember who said a famous thing, but somebody famously said a number of years ago, um, which is also vague because I have no idea when he said it, that the thing that the communist fears or the Marxist fears most in the world is not death, it's not losing, it's being exposed. Being exposed immediately reveals them to be untrustworthy, subversive agents. Now, at the level of tactics, that's at the level of ideology. The exposure is number one. At the level of strategy, exposing that there even is a strategy often undermines the idea. The, thing that, the fact that what they're using are insurgency tactics with a broad strategy of subverting cultural institutions is absolutely crucial to understand. And when you expose how those tactics work or how that strategy plays into a bigger... Uh, set of agendas, then all of a sudden people can see, as it said, they can see the play. And when they see the play, the way that communist strategy and tactics are designed, and I'm not conflating the two, they're on different levels of, of analysis, but the way the, they work hand in hand in glove. And the way that they're designed is so that they will attack, this is classic intelligence operations, it will attack, people will take flack, and then they will think somebody else is what actually attacked them. So then they'll go after the wrong target in, in retaliation. 
what does that look like? Well, um, that might look like Antifa showing up in a city and provoking violence until the police crack down on them. Then they put out a video that makes all the libertarians on the planet get mad at the police. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a, there's like three major points that I, I want to make sure we kind of, one of them might just get pushed off to the side, but you, I, I spent about a year and some change reading what would we, we'd call like Marxist influence literature on civil war, on conflict and violence. And, and the, these range from Ibram X. Kendi to uh, Barbara Walters, uh, the Mark Bray, the Antifa handbook. Um, and then Malcolm Nance, of course, because you got to have the, the class clown, and the <clears throat> the idea of preemptive self defense fit into what you were talking about earlier, in that they view themselves as a different category of human. And mm -hmm. what I've what I've observed is, and and and, and like kind of for context, um, w from a theological argumentation, the there are certain th phrases that are used, and I think that what what oftentimes happens is that people here we hear marxists or even some of the lgbtq world particularly with um the definition of queer use words that we think when we hear them talking they don't know what they're talking about it's like a child mumbling words he doesn't know but the problem is it's completely wrong and so this idea of preemptive self-defense is essentially this se the separation of mankind into two different not ontological categories but almost on that level where one is infinitely justified to do violence against the other because the other can't help by their nature but do a fascism or do an evil. That's right. And so that part is interesting, but that led to something else that you said, which was how it's an insurgency. Now, where did that language come from in your literature? Because I'm coming from military warfighting concept and you're approaching it my background is military and and that kind of world and yours is academia but we're now using the same word yeah. is it a clarifying definition or where did that come from no it came from mao uh so okay. my my fundamental uh belief is that the thing that we generally call woke but this is woke as broadly construed as you can construe it because it includes COVID, it includes hating MAGA, it includes hating, um, you know, the climate change stuff. So it's like woke plus environmental plus anti-conservative plus, uh, you know, the, the public health thing, everything, all the dimensions, right? So it's not just identity politics, but at least encompassing those four dimensions, the tactics derive directly from Mao Zedong's tactics in China, both before the Cultural Revolution in the 1950s, and actually even before he took power with inter with inner party struggles that he had through the 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. um, but then certainly through the 50s, and then most visibly during the early part of the Cultural Revolution, which was mid 1960s. And so Mao Zedong is basically unquestionably one of the most successful cultural infiltrators. Uh, in history. And in fact, his tactics are insurgency tactics. Um, and that's not drawn into question. What's drawn into question or what's uh, the issue of, of debate is whether or not I'm correct in assessing that what we're watching is American Maoism play out or, or Maoism with American characteristics. And I think that I can make the case. In fact, I'm writing the case right now as a book and it's, it's overwhelming me how much more evidence there is for it than I thought there was. And I thought that it was, you know, open and shut, complete, airtight case. And now I'm, as I do the research, filling in the gaps on the book and writing out the details is just stunning even to me how tight it is. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I get this term is that the tactics that are being used are derived from Mao and the people who derived them are the so-called 60s radicals on the one hand in the United States, Canada, throughout the West. The 60s radicals were devotees of Mao. They openly say so. Black nationalists openly brag that they were black adherents to Mao Zedong and Mao Zedong thought. And it's, they've written this in black and white themselves many, many times and they use the tactics. We know, uh, for example, specifically that the long march through the institutions that was called for by the 60s radicals as they moved into the 1970s was openly predicated off of Mao Zedong's tactics. Whether it's Rudy Deutschke naming it, whether it's Herbert Marcuse calling for it, they point specifically to the success Mao, Mao Zedong had in China. But this is also being infused with the 
the application of the same lines of thought through other insurgent uh, radical groups or, or uh, militant groups throughout the world, all the so-called liberation fronts. Mm -hmm. And it's a good time to remind the viewer that Mao's military was called the People's Liberation Army. The one in Israel, or I should say that's combating Israel, is called the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Mm -hmm. The Viet Cong, as we call it, was a liberation front for Vietnam. It's a Vietnamese liberation front. We have yep. these liberation fronts that were all communist in origin, whether it's from Che Guevara or, or Fidel Castro, all through South and Central America again and again. And those are the tactics that are being used against America by radical Americans and their uh, government right now. And, and you've seen it effective in the microcosm of the church if the macrocosm is going to be America with liberation theology, which Correct. sort of turns the, the idea of the gospel into a dialectic between, not a dialectic, no, um, into a nature of oppressors versus oppressed, and that Jesus was well, yeah, a political a savior for sure. for the oppressed and whatever. And so uh, I want to, we're, we're kind of on a good note, and I'm still trying to refine it a little bit because insurgency, well, taking a step back to you brought up about how like antifa will be used as a tactic and, and antifa will use the tactic and I'll, I'll refer to it as a tactic of um uh misconception uh, and that's not the right word but it's essentially it's where they they initiate a fight record the reaction and then use that as justification to get somebody else angry so that would be a, in my world a, a tactic that's something that somebody does to take a specific situation and produce a certain outcome whereas the strategy right. would be to employ the ambiguity of something like antifa to create distrust in the policing system or Correct. to create you know an issue and the problem with these things that we deal that i think that we deal with oftentimes is one we either have the the moral right but not the output or the other one is we have the response sort of down but not the objective. And so with the case that we were, you were talking about earlier, uh, and it's gone for just like poof, in and out, with the case that you're talking about with Marxism in regards to uh, not the woke, I'm trying to find that I'm trying to find the word. It'll come back to me. Um, but it, there's, there, I'll, 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 I'm going to have to pull my question back out because it just poof. What people are looking for is the rules of engagement when it comes to woke, Marxism and woke, wokeism. That's a big challenge. Ah, there it is. Because insurgency, the challenge with insurgency <clears throat> is that it's a very, whether by intentional construct, construct or more or less like kind of a Darwinistic survival of the fittest, insurgency is the antithesis to von Clausewitz style warfare mm -hmm. where right and this is where I, where, where I think your work is important in today not to be like flattering but that's why I've been interested in this conversation so let's keep going so yeah 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 well I mean they so people want to be more familiar they hear this all the time and people don't people are bad at listening and then taking one further step um, this is why my podcast is mostly me reading people things that are in the woke literature because i tell them to read them and they won't so i just said i'll just make a podcast where i read that to people uh well so there's this book that's out there and it's not like there's just one everybody's heard of rules for radicals for example well there's been an expansion of it it's totally available online it's 100 percent available online you should spend some time in it it's called beautiful trouble and it's located on the web at beautifultrouble.org they have strategies they have tactics they have principles they have a to they, have, they have stories that they tell of successful uh, implementation of the various tactics and strategies and principles. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a gigantic website. You could get lost in it for days where they literally spell out how they do what they do. And it's like that people are like, James, how did you figure this out? And I'm like, they can't stop writing it down. And I just bother to read it. They literally publish it so that it's it's open source in a sense. They want open source radicalism. They want any radical who gets radicalized in any random city, say in Texas or Nebraska, to be able to go pick up some resource that they publish online, hit a QR code, go on there and learn how to disrupt their own community. 
And that book, Beautiful Trouble, tells you virtually everything about how they, they do what they do. Uh, your target's reaction is your real action. Do the media's work for them, blah, 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 blah. Put your target in a decision dilemma. So all the strategies and tactics that they employ, especially for this kind of guerrilla street insurgency, is uh, are, are available uh, online. You can see, for example, today I just saw that they've blocked a major overpass on I-80 in Salt Lake City, uh, allegedly in the name of Palestine. They're they're protesting for Palestine. They're waving Palestinian flags, so obviously that's what they're doing, right? Well, no, the issue for Marxists is never the issue. The issue is always and only the revolution. The issue is just a set of clothes that you put on that day in order to advance the revolution. So it was race, now race is passe, so then it was gay, and everybody was wearing rainbows, and now it's Palestine. And next week, it'll be immigrants. It's going to be just something different. Mm -hmm. yeah, because okay. this is because it has nothing to do with the cause that they're celebrating. They don't yeah. care about the cause. They're using the cause. And people really have to accept that it is that cynical. Uh, but in this case, what are they really doing? Well, what, you what do you have, first of all? since the definition of insurgency is like a small, lightly armed or unarmed band of, of you know, militants taking over in a kind of guerrilla warfare style, this sort of business, what are they doing? They're blocking strategic choke points on transportation infrastructure, which allows them to test what's going to happen when, let's say, they had to block the infrastructure at a crucial point, like in the middle of a riot, so that fire trucks or police cars couldn't get there. Um, or, you know, whatever other agenda that they have, maybe they're going to set the city on fire and they don't, they want to let the fire burn as long as possible. So they want to know where they have to post up to block mm -hmm. traffic, to create the kind of traffic jam that maximally disrupts traffic. They want to know how many hours it takes to clear a one mile block up on I-80, for example. So they go out there dressed like they give a shit about Palestine, which they don't for one minute. They get a bunch of hopped up idiots to come out who do care about it for stupid reasons to join them to block the road. But the organizers don't care. The organizers have other objectives. And when we start to understand that we can look behind the curtain to see their other objectives and we can expose what those other objectives are, then we can start to take proper and intelligent countermeasures rather than, you know, a trying to run over people who are blocking streets or just yell that the police or the DAs aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you can actually start to hold people to serious account when you actually know what the purposes are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. Yeah. So if I were to do so counterinsurgency, I, mean, I didn't mean to throw you off at all, but insurgency is typically seen, at, at least in my world, in worldview, in the sense of Insurgency is a strategy that the primary objective is to break the will of the people in support sure. of whatever their their system is, right? So an mm -hmm. insurgency's goal is not necessarily military strategy. It's not to attack strategic locations, not to destroy bases, just necessarily just to disrupt supply lines. It's to do these things in such a way where the population foments an attitude of rebellion or yeah, revolution. Right. And so the, the objective of insurgency is revolution now right as we see through history it's always convenient that that revolution serves somebody better than somebody else and the idea of attaching real or perceived grievances or taking advantage of them is not unfamiliar um it's 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 something that i saw in afghanistan and iraq and and other places it's something that we saw in minneapolis during the, the george floyd riots um saint floyd whatever uh and so the We've seen because I lived there during the the riots. It was a it was a great time, just absolutely fantastic. Um, 150 something buildings on fire in one night. But the point on all of that is, the purpose is to of an insurgency is to identify known or perceived grievances and then maximize them for social yes. pressure to change yes. to foment re revolution. And the solution to it has in a. And it's not even in a military sense. Now, I'm going to use a military example, and then I'm going to break it away because it can be clipped and who cares. But what you do then is you identify the facilitators, and you identify the ringleaders, and you identify the leadership, and you identify the, in a sense, high priests, and you, 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 you kind of root those things out. However, the problem that we face in what I think we're facing a lot in the West is that you can't really do that in the same yeah. way that we've done it for, in, in foreign ways, for example. If um, if China were to create a fake religion, let's call it the Church of Satanism. And this is all metaphor, but or, or all not. It's a not. It's not. I don't have like a 
paper trail of all of this kind of thing, right? But like, mm -hmm. let's just say a foreign country, because I'm using China because it's easy to abstract it to the bad guy across the ocean. Um, but if China were to create a fake religion and anti-Christianity and put that in America and then fund that to cause disruption in the area, they would essentially be going to war against the United States, but not using military strategy. Right. And so they would be hinging on the American concept, or at least the Western concept of the separation of church and state saying you can't persecute our religion, but it's not real, except for it's grabbing people with grievances and wrapping them into the, the worldview. How do you see outside, how do you see ways to challenge that outside of, well, just how do you see ways to challenge that issue? I mean, this is very frustrating as an answer, but the, the right answer is that the most effective thing to do is actually to expose. And of course, um, to downstream from exposure is generating the political will to, well, you can't in the military sense go rip out the ringleaders. You can actually uh, identify other reasons, for example, that they are engaging in uh, illegal activity and you can eventually arrest them, prosecute them. Uh, I call this the iron law of woke corruption. Like right now, people are decided to look into Letitia James, the AG in New York. Um, so they're looking into Letitia James's finances, and those finances are uh, maybe legal, but they're, there's a question. But they're extremely dirty, uh, as one would expect. And what you find is again and again and again, uh, where you have this kind of activity going on, there's a ton of corruption happening as well. Well, I'm not saying anything about Letitia James one way or the other. What I'm saying is that some of these cases are blatantly illegal and um, building up enough exposure leads to the will and the capacity to prosecute um, and to even have change of guard. We even saw, you know, Kessa Boudin got thrown out in San Francisco because of his unwillingness to prosecute as the DA there. Uh, so they're, the political will, even in San Francisco, not that they're in like a great position, but they have a far better DA now, the political will can be generated through exposure and repeated exposure not only generates that, but it all the ability to legally rip out the leadership when they're committing other crimes or engaging in other misdeeds. But it also um, sows an inoculation, which means that people start to distrust those organizations. I'll give you an example that was for real. I went to the Moms for Liberty National Summit in Philadelphia last summer, and it was massively protested by well over three, maybe over 500 protesters showed up. It was really uh, dangerous outside. They were throwing things, especially at, like kids, um, you know, as they would do. They were doing grotesque, various public displays, dancing with in very lewd and sexual ways with road signs and trees and, and other people and whatever else. And, you know, causing all kinds of doing intimidation, doing all kinds of things. And so then I walked down one day, we sneak out the side, walk down to South Philly so I can get me some cheesesteaks like proper. And I get down there and I get recognized because, you know, I've got a bit of a public face. And so these guys start talking to me and they're like, what are you in Philly for? And I told them about the Moms for Liberty. And they go, is that why there's that big protest up downtown? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, well, what's that about? Why are they protesting? And I happened to have the flyer that they had come and sprayed all over the hotel that said that it was being done by the Young Communist League of, of Philly. And so I show this to one of these Southies, and he, or I guess that's a Boston term, one of these South Philly guys. And he's, you know, it becomes like immediate stereotype. You know, the Italian accent goes from like zero to mafia in like one second. And he's like, <laughs> what? Communists in my city? Oh, hell no. We're going up there, you know? And he's just like right now, like, oh, it's commies. And so actually, as it turned out, Moms for Liberty as an organization, not just with angry South Philadelphia Italians, was able to speak on record with evidence. Well, you know, you were massively protested, blah, blah, blah. What happened? Well, it was the Young Communist League. So it's communists who are protesting us. The communists have established themselves in America. And here's evidence pieces, A, B, C, D, you know, hard evidence that there were flying protesters in, that the majority of the people there weren't even local, that this was an orchestrated demonstration. And what happens is the, the group Moms for Liberty gains massive standing and the protesters, uh, the next time they roll out, it doesn't look organic anymore. People are suspicious of its organic nature and it isn't as able to sway public opinion or to motivate politicians to do their will as it was, say, in summer 2020 when they basically ran roughshod over the country. Um, and it sounds dumb, but exposure turns out to be almost like magic medicine in this case. You start to notice that there are people whose goal is to sow division, sow distrust, and it becomes very easy to, to, to defy them by 
not trusting them and to um, start working together with the people they say you aren't supposed to work together with. When you say it that way, like I know you 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 said a couple times, and I'll, this is me paraphrasing it, that you say exposure is somewhat of maybe cold comfort or it's like not a, an emotionally satisfying um, re response. That's right. You know, and so like a, a small story is when the George Floyd riots took off in Minnesota, there were a number of young black men or young men, particularly who rose to sudden fame because they were at every protest and they were giving their impassioned speeches and they were doing their things. And um, I, it, like there was a good six of them that all ended up getting individually locked up for human trafficking or rape kind of cases. And, and it's an interesting problem because it's like, these are our moral par paragons now because they represent the current thing. And to a T, every single one of them was not really above board morally on generally perceived moral things like, let's call it consent or whatever. But you know, they sure. one of them, a couple of them were running a brothel out of like a, a shop and some of them were doing this. And it's just like it, and all of it off of their sudden fame. So that's an interesting problem. Now, I'm going to counter you a little bit on the exposure thing being not necessarily pessimistic, but um, I think it is the right antidote because in in a sense, it it's not it's not about violence or nonviolence. It's it, it functions as a nullification. That's right. Because, right. Because when I'm in when, when we're engaging, let's call, talk, just use use of force as a reference. Um, as a, in, in, from a moral system, not from a legal system, not from a military system, but from a moral system, we like the idea of the battleground of ideas. We like this 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 concept that we're gonna, you and I are gonna have a rational conversation. Maybe it's a debate. Maybe it's just a chat. Maybe whatever. But if it comes down to a p point where you are an aggressor and there is no option for con for conversation or debate, I am not obligated to debate you on whether or not you should stab me with a knife. That's when I'm going to use force or in the issues that we encounter with some forms of radicalized domestic terrorism or not even domestic. There are times where somebody crosses a road or crosses a line, so to speak, where there's no longer like a pathway to social redemption in how we interact according to normal responses. And that's when we send SEAL Team 6 to go do the job, right? And so mm -hmm. we believe in this sort of casually, but exposure is like the, the way that you were describing exposure functions as a bit of a middle ground where it neutralizes the threat, but it doesn't create the outcome that is in some ways the objective of the tactic that's being used against you. So I, I don't know if I'd be so pessimistic about it. Oh, I'm actually not I, I repeat it everywhere but it is not it's, it's not satisfying and it gets very frustrating because the expectation which is not met in many cases and i'll qualify that in a moment is that when you expose something that justice will start the wheels of justice will start to grind into action one way or another somebody will get arrested somebody will get fired somebody you know seal team six will show up whatever it happens to be in very many cases what we're finding is that has not been happening or doesn't happen consistently or doesn't happen immediately uh, which is extraordinarily demoralizing in and of itself but that's because we've let our institutions get captured so viciously over the last several decades but i will qualify that by highlighting the differences between what happened in the wake of, of the death of uh, St. Floyd in, in 2020 and what's happened, say, for example, with this um, recent character, the, the trans girl or non-binary girl or whatever she was that died after ne an altercation no at school. Like, like Knox, she's got some odd Nex like or that. Nex or something like yeah, this. Nex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a sad story. We, we don't know how or why she died, or maybe that's known now and out, but I haven't seen it. But it was not as a result of the altercation at any rate, is, is was determined. So she wasn't beaten to death as the left decided to run with. But the thing is, is and it could, this is just one example out of 100 in the last year. In 2020, they put out these stories and America was like, ah, you know, and reacted. And they put out these stories now and America doesn't react. We're like, wait a minute, what's really going on? What's the real story here? Like, slow your horses, CNN. We don't. We're not buying in. So the the dissatisfaction of exposure is that in a corrupt system, it doesn't generate the results you want immediately. But over time, things start to shift, which is what actually needs to happen. And then, so what I tell people is that the way that exposure works with a corrupt or illegitimate circumstance or system 
that, that is harboring criminals and so on. It's like any other big organized criminal enterprise. It fails very slowly, then all at once. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah, so you delegitimize and delegitimize and delegitimize, and they just go on the force of the fact, say, that they run the presidency or they run the DA's office or they run whatever, and they have the power to just kind of keep trucking. But they don't maintain their moral legitimacy. They're burning down all of those abstract forms of capital, maybe in addition to their actual material capital, as they go. And then all of a sudden, when they hit zero, the whole thing can fall apart very, very quickly. And what a lot of people forget is that a lot of the people involved in these kinds of organized crime type operations are in it for themselves. They're not in it for the organization. They're not even that ideologically committed in an ideological sense. So the second the deal starts looking like it's going to go bad, they become songbirds. They're the ones who are going to show up and throw somebody higher than the hierarchy throw them under the bus, get them arrested, get them dealt with, get them held accountable so it's not themselves. And this this kind of striver problem, which is that, you know, from, from the perspective of the good and, and the moral side of society, strivers are a major problem because they don't seem to have any principles. They'll just do what they're mercenaries. They'll do whatever the highest bidder is. They don't have a sense of right or wrong. But it's a sword that cuts both ways. This is strivers or um, opportunists, whatever you want to call them, are really a two-edged blade because for the other, the other team, the second the deal starts looking bad, it's like, just imagine a two-edged two sword and it's coming back down on their forehead now. Um, those strivers will undercut them in a heartbeat if they think that they get to rise to the top of the new pile. And so um, by enough exposure to make the whole deal look bad, you can have a sudden mass revolt, what the kids used to call the rats jumping ship. Um, well, it's the rats first, and then it's like the corrupt mateys that are jumping ship next. And when they jump ship, they will sell the captain out so quickly. Uh, if it saves their skin or gives them advantage in the new program, they'll all pretend they were never part of it, that they got sucked in, that they got brainwashed, they got coerced. They'll Every bit of blackmail, they'll say they were done at force. I mean, these people will turn on their handlers so fast. This is how organized crime always gets taken down. This is how RICO works. This is um, this is how corrupt regimes break, but it's very frustrating in the short term because you, you expose, you say, look, there's pornographic books in the schools with the kids. You expect a responsible adult to say, whoa, we didn't know that. Let's put a stop to it. And then what you find out is that they want them there and they're going to fight tooth and nail to keep them there until finally the whole legitimacy of the program collapses at some later date. So that it creates a bit of a problem. I think the attention issue is that um, one thing that you see in the idea of holy war. Now, holy war is a bit of a bad term. I think I think it's I, I think in 2021, 2024, Sorry, I don't I don't think it's that useful of a term anymore because it 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 it. it it doesn't really account for like Charles Taylor's account for secularism, and and, and that's a bit of a nuanced argument. But instead, um, is that you have two problems. You have one, on the one hand, if you're saying that you start undermining, you start you know, the the system. This this you have your crime network that's falling apart. People are going to leave to try to go keep their life going after the after, in the days after the mafia as a sort. The other issue that I run into though is that you have you threaten the ideological supremacy of a condition, and this is what I've seen consistently with the idea of socialism, particularly communism, to be more specific, and that is that um, communism cannot abide anything which challenges its legitimacy, intellectual or otherwise, so it must f use methods to destroy it. And that that is one major reason to account for so much death in the 1900s. It's, and, and, and I was listening to your, your bit earlier today on fascism as sort of the worship of the state. Um, and I think it's, I, 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 I concur, those who have listened to the show know that I concur because I've, I, I, I very much so see it from that theological worldview. The problem with that worldview, though, is it's not mercenary, it's committed. And so hmm. how do you sort between those two problems? Like, I'll be very clear, like a, so a person who is willing to call themselves a socialist is either going to be found out to be your rat sinking, jumping the ship, and they're not committal, but the, it, and, or they're going to be your, your zealot of sorts. And I have an issue in, in the way that we approach that, particularly because it sort of relies on the insurgency problem, yet we're still talking about it in the public forum. And that right. is... And that is, um, 
if it's kind of like the idea of the stupid and the malicious, which mm -hmm. is, is, is odd. It's like, well, the dumb people are led by smart, but evil people like, okay, fine. Then who are the smart, but evil people? Give me a list and we'll have a solution. No, there is none. It's just them out there. Now you have a conspiracy theory. Some in, in mm -hmm. group out there is doing the thing. And then this is where I think the dark side of exposure comes out of. It's just, it's just, it's almost like all I do is talk about it because it doesn't matter to me. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, that that that's not helpful. Um, the the fact is that we're talking on a couple of different levels here. I think, for example, a lot of what's being a, happening in the street is by very committed people. Um, oh, for sure. A lot of yeah. what's happening in the institutions, uh, especially within the academic institutions, is being shepherded by very committed people. And it's also being, of course, brought in by a lot of dumb people who don't quite know what they're handling. I run into that in education all the time, that teachers are having their eyes open to realize how bad something like social emotional learning is when it sounds so good and sounds so pleasant. And they're, I've seen the shock on their faces when they start to realize what it really is. So I know that there's a lot of these kind of people going along. Where the strivers primarily arise is that we're in a unique phase of communism right now that seems paradoxical. Uh, if communism is the right word, which is that um, communism is operating primarily on the global scale right now through corporations. And I don't think a lot of these corporate leaders are in fact committed socialists. I think that they in fact are playing in the realm of the very abstracted capital that Marx was complaining about could eventually arise within the capitalist system, which has been erected th primarily through proxy investment, ISS, Glass-Lewis, BlackRock, Vanguard, these huge um, asset uh, allocators, really, uh, asset managers. Um, BlackRock does almost all of its business with other people's money, is the short, short version of what I mean by that. Uh, Overwhelmingly, they don't have six or 20 or whatever the number happens to be trillion dollars in assets. They have that many dollars in assets under their management, which they have capacity to do voting, uh, you know, corporate voting for within shareholder meetings and so on. So they have the power and other powers over the corporate uh, world. I've talked to a number of corporate executives who feel like they're actually kind of held hostage. Um, and some of whom just think, well, they've heard they've heard this magic spell, and this is one of the most dangerous and effective magic spells. It's, it's the spell of inevitability. They've heard this spell right here. There's a change coming. There's nothing you can do about it. It will be very good for you if you go with us. It will be very bad if you resist us. Um, if you kind of dither, we'll see what happens. And so that's a magic spell. It's the spell of inevitability. We're going to transform the world. The systems are going to transform. It's already out of your control. So help us out. And a lot of people have been either sold on the the lion, sustainable and inclusive future sounds good. A lot I know that some CEOs actually of some major corporations that are in that category. Others have been um, they feel trapped. They're like, I don't really want to do this, but I have to. You know, it's a major problem because entities like the World Economic Forum and the United Nations write articles and books complaining about phenomena that they call woke washing and green washing, where corporations are only pretending to do the stuff to check off the boxes because they have to. They don't really want to be woke or green. They just have to because they have to check off the boxes. Those are the people that I'm saying are strivers that are likely to start jumping ship if they feel like this is all going to go bad. People who oh. feel like they have um, too much blame in the system but could easily get out of that by... Uh, by by telling on their their corporate masters basically yeah in a microcosm it applies to religious leaders too because you're either a you are you are now forced between two horns of a dilemma to get gouged by you're either a christian nationalist or mm -hmm. you're a hypocrite because you're not enough of whatever my thing is that's right so i you know i, I think that i think that stands out i i get to see it from my little my little ivory tower of sorts where you have that problem is once you see that it's a it's a the, the 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 horns of the dilemma are set up to gouge you you it's not necessarily that you just say i'm not a part of it anymore but there is some strength to recognize that the trap is a trap but the yeah, traps, well, and you, the, you the, start the to see other the, options well yeah the, and the teeth but the thing about the, the teeth of the trap are either kind of social or they're just purely emotional Mm -hmm. Like for you know, if you're gonna if 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 you and I sat down at a table and you and you came to me and said, well, um, you're either gonna like me or I'm gonna beat you. I don't. I'm not gonna like you. It doesn't matter. It's a lose lose scenario. And uh, you know what I mean. Like it's it's. So I think it helps with that that dilemma. 
really well where you recognize this person's a dishonest interlocutor. I'm not really interested in their well-being. I'm not, not, I mean, not their well-being. I'm not really interested in their opinion. Maybe I have to be concerned about their ability to affect my career, but let's not sweep that under the rug. So with the issue then, <clears throat> with the issue on, on, on sort of the, the, cor the corporations and the world leaders, um, so you say they're not committed. What about what about the, a worldview? Something that would be like Imago Imperium, which is a, a twist on the Latin for creating the image of God. But this idea that people, I think, the root concept of communism is Imago Imperium. It is we recreate the world in our own image, in the image yeah, of, of the empire. And so, how then? What would you say to people who are not in that structure, and then people who are in that structure, just for the sake of our conversation? Because I, I say about them or to them? No, the problem that I'm running into is that okay. So if you're if if you're the leader of a CEO, you're a CEO of a company. You've got all this issue, and you're you're feeling that you're being held hostage by the ideology, right? Um, on the one hand, I I get I get I get the concept, but the issue is that like is that you're you're you are then you are being blinded to so many billions of people who are sitting here going, we see it too. We don't want to be a part of that system. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the idea that the, is if the, the, the problem that I'm facing is that the people in those kind of positions can choose to not play by the rules of the game and that, how does, how does that option get communicated better? Oh, you know? right. Yeah. Well, they, first of all, they actually have to be convinced in many cases that they, Fair can opt out of the rules of the game, that they can go on their own, and that there are pathways to success if they do go on their own um, outside of this kind of uh, dragnet structure that they've been caught up in. Um, communicating that to them is often very difficult because they often don't see other pathways. And especially when you depend on lines of, of credit to run your business at scale, you're in, a, you're in a lot of trouble. Or if you're a publicly traded company of a certain size, you can be in a lot of trouble, which makes it very difficult. Um, what actually has to happen in those cases, though, is another order down. It's not beseeching these people to play by different rules. Uh, it's actually creating a different set of incentives that allow them or, or tool levers by which they can start to play by different rules. What do I mean? What are some examples? Um, so one example, imagine that just hypothetically that we have some new presidential administration, whoever it is, is a super based constitutional badass, decides he's gonna go full antitrust on this stuff and says everybody that's involved has however many months of amnesty. If you come out and tell us why, how this court cartel works, then um, you're scot-free. You can't be prosecuted for your involvement for anything that you did whatsoever for the rest of your life. Um, but you gotta show up you know, and testify. And the thing is, is at the end of four months, six months, three months, whatever, we're going to take everything we've amassed and everything we already know, and we're going to go after this thing full blast Rico. Well, that changes the ball game a lot if you had such an apparatus in the administration. Another tool that's way more simple to get a hold of, however, are, are things that state legislatures and Congress could enact, which are pathways to private and class action. Um, there are a lot of fiduciary lawsuits waiting to happen, fiduciary responsibility lawsuits waiting to happen against a lot of these corporations. I mean, it's very famous that in the last few months, Mark Cuban has been going online and trying to defend DEI and openly got told by the EOCC commissioner that he's in violation of, of civil rights law with the policies that he uses for hiring, which boil down to racial quotas. And it's only a matter of time until somebody figures out, wait, we can sue. In that case, it would be suing under civil rights law, but there's fiduciary responsibility for shareholders. There are laws for that. There are all these places where lawsuits kind of exist, but they kind of don't exist um, because it's not clear. Civil rights law is interpreted frequently under disparate impact, so it's not clear that we could, say, destroy DEI using civil rights law. But if we were to target Griggs versus Duke Power with a strategic set of lawsuits that make their way up to the Supreme Court, which is a decision that opens the door to all of that, it's the, the beginning of disparate impact analysis, well, all of a sudden the entire legal landscape changes. What happens when the legal landscape changes? We don't have to hypothesize. So for example, in the state of Missouri, not that long ago, they changed the statute of limitations on 
certain types of medical malpractice lawsuits, in particular medical interventions on minors, um, I think specifically to do with transgender. They didn't ban them. They didn't come out with a law and say, you can't do these surgeries. They said that anybody who undergoes these surgeries has until 25 or 30 years or something like that, instead of two as their statute of limitations for uh, malpractice lawsuits. And all the university hospitals and all the major medical networks in Missouri all of a sudden decided more or less overnight that there was too much liability in performing the surgeries and they stopped doing them. And so creating pathways for whether it's civil rights law, whether it's action for, for malpractice, whether it's antitrust law, creating pathways for, for prox prosecution and action that or even just finding existing pathways and then taking advantage of those and throwing out the suit um, can actually start to change the liability field. These CEOs operate in this kind of weird alternate universe of liabilities. And they're just kind of, their day-to-day -day is basically, they have decisions to make for their business, but when it comes to all these kinds of culture war issues, it's basically what's going to get me in the least amount of hot water with the various people that I'm going to end up in hot water with. And so shifting around the liability field for them, especially, like I said, in civil rights, environmental responsibility, fiduciary uh, responsibility, and the like, antitrust would be huge. I'm at, I, what is it? ISS and Glass-Lewis control something like 97% of whatever it is they control which is by definition a full duopoly and their collusion could be super easy. We, they don't even, when you have a duopoly, you don't even have to collude. You only have to see what the other one does and then change your policies as quickly as possible afterwards. And you have de facto collusion hitting those 97% of the market is in two firms. Really sounds like this is ripe for some antitrust attacks. These kind of things are on the table, but for some reason we the, the conservative side, which would be the one that matters in this case, has virtually they have like five civil rights lawyers. So like total. So they have no that we don't. It's like we have a war. We know the battlefield and we have no army um, in that many is, cases. I, I guess I, I'll, 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 I am very surprised by that. You're saying there's, I mean, there's just, are you saying there's literal five or just an extremely small amount? It's an extremely small number. I don't okay. know. I spoke with them. Okay. Um, Harmy Dillon about this and she and I had a conversation I guess last fall and she said that one of the biggest weaknesses in conservative legal practice right now given the circumstances is that there are very very few lawyers in on the conservative side of the aisle who have specialized in civil rights law that was always considered to be a bastion of the left and most of the ones she is somebody who has specialization in civil rights law uh, who are civil rights attorneys who consider themselves on the conservative side many of them were in fact formerly leftist and they became civil rights lawyers to do leftist things with it and then switched sides for some reason or another in terms of their political commitments uh but we have very few uh conservative civil rights attorneys because it's been considered to be a uh, leftist playing field uh, so proportionally speaking if, if we wanted to create a say conservative alternative to the aclu there's not enough attorneys to staff it they're just they don't exist so here's the problem then is that you you present an issue there's not enough and then so somebody uh, somebody who's listening goes well I, then i'll go to school i'm already looking at law school and i'm already frustrated by these issues and and they're they already have become a major concern like i, I think it's genuine genuine authentic concern for these issues and then so then they think to themselves well i'll go to school for civil law and and the first thing they're met with is they're the only conservative in their entire teaching block for the entire mm -hmm. western eastern seaboard and they and they're not going to get into a school no or it's very challenging so they have uh, to look at themselves honest to god it's a it's a real analogy at this point they have to look at themselves as the pioneers who were the first black americans trying to get into law schools fair enough i mean fair enough i think i do you think how, how what would you say then because you, you, you've been in academia, you've been in, um, I mean, would you describe yourself as in academia right now? No, I left no. a long time ago. Okay. So I bugged out. You bugged out, backpack and all. Um, so then what input would you have for somebody who's considering that? Let's just, that, that's considering that go that sees a problem and says, oh, here I am, send me. Like that's, mm -hmm. that is something that I'm seeing on the ground with, let's just call it gun culture, is mm -hmm. that the attitude is... And, and I'm trying to be a little bit deliberate on this shifting from, 
well, we need to get together and fight against the tyranny or whatever. And I'm not talking about guns and battlefields. I'm talking about so political movement and social movement. It very simple, like none of the disingenuous arguments. I'm not talking about people fighting the government. I'm talking about, well, we need to pool our resources with somebody like the Firearms Policy Coalition to go after these laws that are or or yeah, even to sue the government sue the government the, the the bet one of the better examples would be like maxim defense is a firearms manufacturer that had a major role in the affecting of the brace ruling which was a very political move by the biden doj identifying a certain firearm as being common with their political opposition therefore targeting it through illegal means by having a non-legislative organization redefine something because it would cause demoralization you're seeing this like long tail strategy that um really illustrates the difference between smart evil people and people who go along with it because you have issues but now you have this so i'm go going back to the question you got a kid and i'm using kid loosely somebody who's interested in law school for the purpose of civil rights, what would you what would you say to encourage them, or um, as a bit of like advice if you have any? Yeah, it's funny you ask. I actually ended up I was at a talk on the 29th, so just the other day, um, and I actually got asked this exact question by somebody in exactly that position. So I was face to face with said young person. So I get to just rehash something, and I don't have to think of something on the spot. Uh, the fact is that there's a little bit of the hey, listen. You don't have to compromise who you are. You don't have to compromise yourself at all, but you're going to have to understand that you're going to play a part of it. You're going to play a game. There's a little bit of playing a game. You've got to be able to get in. You've got to be able to pass your classes. You've got to be able to get through. And what I tell them is you're going to two schools at once. So your job as a, whether you want to call it an oppressed minority or, uh, you know, whatever, uh, an embattled identity, whatever you want to call this, the situation that, that such a person would find themselves in, you you don't get, there's no easy path, right? There is no shortcut. It's not going to be fair. And it's time to go ahead and put on your Marcus Aurelius pants and stop complaining. Um, Cause if you can endure it, endure it and stop complaining. That's the way, that's what he said. And um, if you can't endure it, maybe you better do something different, right? And so just choose better. But if you can endure it, you're gonna have to endure. So put on your Marcus Aurelius pants, go in and buck up to the fact that you're going to double school. Number one, maybe even triple. You've got to get through your classes, which, which means you got to play the game. I don't like it. You don't like it. We all don't like it, but it's the nature of the thing. Number two, you have to not lose yourself, which means you've got to enact figuring out how you're going to navigate that. Mostly what I encourage these people to do, given that they're academic and given what I've read about the psychology of thought reform and brainwashing and how it can be resisted, um, studying the the prisoners in Chinese prison camps, for example, is that studying the process itself is actually an inoculation against the process. And so if you go in and you're taking notes for passing your class, school number two is that you are studying what they're trying to do to you. So you're studying leftist law as a flawed doctrine while you're having to report on leftist law to pass your classes. And then the third, maybe third, if you want to call it that, is that you actually are creating that dossier of um, of, of, less, of leftist law fallacies and practices so that you are going to become not just somebody who's competent in civil rights law, but understands the enemy's playing field and tactics and strategy extremely well when they get to the courtroom and can actually counteract it. But you've got triple school. You've got to learn real law, too, actually. Um, so you've got to read outside of your assigned reading. You're going to have to be, a, in, you're going to have to take initiative. You're going to have to be go-getter. Uh, you're going to have to take, when you have a case law class, usually they build one after another. So you're going to have, you know, you're going to read the first case and then week and the second week you're going to read this case and the third week you're going to read that. What you need to do is have the discipline to read the first case, the first week, the first and the second case, the second week, the first, second and third cases, the third week, and really have the discipline to really deeply study what's going on, where it's going right, where it's going wrong, and what the better applications of the law are while figuring out a way to protect your, uh, to be, I guess, a little metaphorical with it, mind and soul from the attempt to indoctrinate, brainwash, and break and demoralize you, um, which some proportion of people have those skills. Some people, some proportion of people have that temperament. If you don't, you're probably better off doing something different or testing yourself and seeing. But if you do, buckle down and you're going to become a weapon on the other side of this, like, uh, you know, like something that belongs in a Marvel movie. 
Well, there's so there's something to be said. So um, my background, military background, was special operations at Ranger Battalion, which two thousand eight, two thousand nine into two thousand thirteen is 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 a, a long time ago now. But we had a saying that kind of comes up: is everyone wants to be a ranger until it's time to do ranger things, and that can mean one thing over here. But the other side of it is a lot of the selection process has kind of two phases, and this is what I've seen across military application too. Um, particularly in the special operations world, there's sort of the binaries, which is, can you do, can you make the run in time? Yes or no? The answer is no, you're out. Can you make the ruck in time? If the answer is no, you're out. And so these are the easy binaries. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do the PT test? Can you, are, are you in shape? Or these kind of things. Now there is people with nuance will understand there's a little bit of arguments in there, but we'll let that go. And then there's a little bit more of the subjective. And so you think you take something like Ranger School, which is different than selection, it's its own process. But there are objective standards, and then there are somewhat subjective standards, where the grader is looking for a certain outcome, but might have some influence over whether or not he sees it based on subjectivity of his environment. Um, but when it comes to people who don't pass that binary, or they don't make it through selection. They don't. They don't have the mindset to look. You're not trying to argue with the the greater on the the merits of a situation. Case in point for my example, which might not have as much relevance to you, is that like I, I was in a selection process, not a selection process. I was in ranger school, and you have to get you have to perform certain skills. And the one thing that I was doing was setting up an ambush for a vehicle in a in in, in Minecraft joke. Uh, but and I and. I, Part of the ambush of my team was using a rocket launcher, and rocket launchers have backblast, and if something ref if it reflects the pressure where you can kill your whole team, and so I had been I'd used that firearm before on deployments, and so I I moved my team to the top of a ridge instead of in the valley because I didn't want them to get killed by the backblast. Well, the instructor didn't really know much about backblast apparently because he failed me on that ground, so I had to do the whole thing all over again. Now, if I was going to take a utilitarian approach or even more pragmatic, I would have just gone along with whatever he said. But, you know, at, in the end of the day, we made it through. The interesting, yeah. the interesting problem that I'm having, uh, the thing that I like that the way that you're presenting it with this college thing, th this idea of going to law school for civil is that you're not presenting it in like a moral imperative of everybody has to go become a civil lawyer tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is that some people have that. And all they're waiting for, uh, and I imagine somebody out there is just waiting for someone to give them permission, like go to school for civil law, go fight the good fight here. You're going to have to be subversive. You're going to have to get underneath. You're going to have to play underneath the radar because you're not going to go debate your teacher on the merits of tort law in this in regard or whatever the word is, you know, but yeah, right. I think I no, you've got it. You've got to almost split your soul a little bit to get through. And honest, in all honesty, there because mm -hmm. this isn't the kind of thing that necessarily you're describing with with a rocket launcher. Um, nobody's going to die. What you have to do when you play the game is you you do you take a with regard to your coursework. You have a fully utilitarian ethic. What do I have to do to be able to pass the class? And if you don't have the ability to say that I'm doing I'm doing what I'm doing in this class in order to achieve the end of getting the law degree and the the law license to practice, then you're not cut out for what you've got to do because that's a that's that's a bar you have to jump over to become the lawyer, right? And yeah. so what? So it's a, it's a pony jumping over a bar. So that doesn't mean who you are. So you do what you have to do to get through. But then on the other hand, you have to dedicate your time and resources to learning what to do in reality when you actually get on the other side and you have your license and your degree. And so uh, that's why you have double duty. I actually spoke with a teacher early on uh, in kind of the big public explosion of all of this, who said that she was doing that so that she could learn to be a real teacher. She'd go to school all day and learn. This is where I got the idea. She was learning all of the, you know, baloney woke education stuff day after day and passing all of her tests and learning it. And then in the evening, she was going home and reading, you know, now out so-called out of date old education books to learn how to actually be a teacher. And oh, wonderful. So she was doing an at home education program that, you know, like in Go Goodwill Hunting, anybody could get for a dollar fifty at the library uh, in late fees. 
But meanwhile, she was doing it simultaneously. So double duty, she was doing it simultaneously with going through the actual schooling process so that she could get the credential to practice. But the credential, she knew it was all just baloney. She said that the advantage was is satisfying these um, these woke requirements is, is preposterously easy. Uh, I can attest to that from my experience in the grievance studies affair. It turns out to be extraordinarily easy to write theory based kind of nonsense papers arguing for their positions. Um, the logic is kind of fast and loose. You can kind of say whatever you want to say, and you just kind of can write this stuff down as fast as it can be written, more or less. So uh, it turns out not to be like having to go to double school in practice. It's more like going to like 1.25 school or something. Mm -hmm. It's it, Woke stuff's really easy. They don't want people to know that it's really easy, but it's all a formula. It's always racism. It's always it, it, It's just a simple formula every single time. I, and then coming I, up with a rationalization to connect the dots. I, I think that I think I think the simplicity of wokeism is actually quite visible now. It's more like it's a rot that people don't know how to deal with. Well, yeah, I mean, at we least touched in on two this. different categories, but the way that you so it's it's extraordinary simplicity and something we touched on earlier come together to really tell you what it is, what's really going on here. You said mm -hmm. that they treat themselves as though they're even almost ontologically a different sort of being, like a superior, like a rather than homo sapiens, uh, homo deus, to pull off of literally what uh, Yuval Noah Harari at the uh, World Economic Forum has, those, the title of his second book was Homo Deus, right? So it's no longer wise human or wise ape, it's now God ape, right? And what, what, what we're dealing with is people who, the old word for them, and I'm not talking about Calvinism here, the old word going back to the first century for these people was the elect. They yes. are in a, they're in a cult where they believe that they have identified the secret knowledge of the universe. These are called Gnostic cults. Marxism is a Gnostic yep. cult. Yep. They behave accordingly, which means they have an entitlement, a superiority complex. They exempt themselves from all the rules because they are the ones who see what the you know, they see behind the curtain of all of life. They see behind the curtain of everything. And everybody else has to be controlled, shepherded, or even killed because they're holding everybody else back because they can't see behind the curtain. They don't know the real story of life. And this is what we're dealing with. This is how they act. This is why they believe themselves to be so much in, more entitled. They think that they know the secret of how society and, in fact, the world itself actually work mm -hmm. um, because of their, their insight. Marx's gnosis, they called it gnosis in the first century. What Marx called it is socialism, that, that human beings are an intrinsically social being that has forgotten that we are because of the individualism predicated off of the ownership of private property. But if we were to transcend, not abolish, abolish is low level, transcend is high level, but he says both at different times, transcend private property, we would return to our true essential nature, who we really are. And we'll know that the world that we've been flung into was a world of oppressor versus oppressed is actually a construction of the oppressors um, that we need not be subjected to. And so anyway, this tells us what we're really dealing with here. This is genuinely a cult religion, but what does that have to do with it being simple? They're all very simple. The secret sauce of reality is always something very, very simple. There is a better life out there that they don't want you to have is what it all comes down to every single time. But yes. I, as the cult leader, want to lead you or to liberation or into the promised land of what you've always deserved. So it's always an extraordinarily simple formulation. It's a childish formulation of how the world genuinely works. Um, Which I, I, I have to jump in on there because it's, this is why you get like the obsession with uh, Star Wars as a worldview or... Yeah. Uh, or even like the Harry Potter thing. It's it's like, it, 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 I, I've seen it, so in, in a bit of a deep dive into conspiracy theory, not like conspiracy theories, but not even the psychology, but more like the worldview of a conspiracy theory typically follows a pattern, which is kind of like the straw lord ver or the straw man version of Lord of the Rings. You've got, mm -hmm. you've got this evil bad guy or bad guys whatever they are out there and then you've got the normies who live in the bubble and then there's you and the only thing that distinguishes you from the normies is that you see it you see the system and mm -hmm. then the only thing that distinguishes you from the bad guys is you're good but there's a there's a there's a dynamic that happens here the more powerful the bad guy is described the more powerful you must be because that's how good you are 
Yeah. So mo- the idea of a conspiracy theory, and why, where, where I think you're, the the Gnostics, particularly the early, the, like 100, 280 Gnostics, and then this sort of mysticism that has followed through into the form of the conspiracy theory is actually just a very old human mentality, mm-hmm. which formulates the world such that they gain all the moral value of being the Jedi, the hero, the secret good, without having any moral responsibility whatsoever, except mm-hmm. for to know. That's and right. And then, yep. And so it, it, for the individual, they don't see themselves as part of the cult because they see because their identity is so wrapped up in being a part of it. That's that's the danger that, that comes out of no, that. No, that's exactly right. So the big bad guy that lived in, in Mordor in the first century Gnostic cults is called the Demiurge, mm-hmm. which is yep. from the Greek uh, Demiurgos, which means artisan or builder. So that's the creator of the world. It means creator. So Demiurge just comes from the Greek for creator of the world. And so the belief was that the Demiurge or Sauron mm-hmm. built the world as a prison to imprison man within it. Of course, that's not the story of Lord of the Rings. Like you said, it's straw man, Lord no. of the Rings, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, straw the man, people exactly. who are the elect who have awoken to this are the people who believe they understand this very simple, mm-hmm. very moralized black and white polarized world. And all the stupid normies don't get it. All the stupid normies are caught up in it. They have bourgeois values is what Marx or Mao would have said. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been, they've been, you know, brainwashed by, the illusion of reality to not know what's really behind uh, behind reality, which is that, in fact, there is a true good that's being obscured by the existence of this evil, and they're a part of that true good. And so this is this is why their whole worldview is so simple, but it's also so brutal and so um, vicious and so entitled. Um, and a lot of people don't don't understand that this is why they believe that uh, they have this complete right to justify any means in the name of their end, which is to, in, in their mind, they're defeating Sauron and uh, in, in liberating the world from, the, from, the, from darkness. But in reality, they've got it all upside down. They're actually just destroying everything. Yeah. Well, I think it's C.S. Lewis who's credited for saying, uh, for credited for almost coining the term chronological snobbery. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, in its simplistic form, it's, we might be more technologically advanced, but that does not mean we are more intelligent. And no. this mentality of the woke, I've come to see in a kind of a difficult, it's a bit of a moral problem, but it's, it's in a difficult sense, as simple as a man in a loincloth with a spear saying, give me your stuff. I'm better than you. And it's, it's not, it's not articulate. It's not. It's not, um, it's not like this compassionate, well-thought-out argument. It's just, well, I want your stuff, and I will say whatever I need to say because I believe I deserve your stuff by dint of who I am, by my divine right of individual, you know, divine right of whatever, of the Gnostic, that I get your stuff. And that is, it's, and it changes words, and it changes names, and it changes languages, and it changes phrases. Um, now that's a no, that's just different clothing. They just put on different clothes for the moment. Which, by the way, if you look up the traits, and I don't want to drag into this, but if you look up the traits of psychopathy, one of the traits of a psychopath is that they say whatever they have to say in any given argument, just to win that argument, no matter how the lies pile up over time. You know, so I tell you, you know, oh yeah, I'm a millionaire, blah 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 blah, so that I can like impress you and you'll do whatever. And then the next guy around, I turn the corner and I'm like, oh, I'm I'm dirt poor. I need a donation, blah blah blah. And I just it doesn't matter what the lies are, and it doesn't matter that over time they contradict each other or pile up. The goal is to win each interaction in that moment, as though all other moments don't exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, they they'll they'll figure it out when they get to that place but this is all based off of their belief that they have the secret knowledge of the universe and in particular with marxism by the way the secret knowledge that they have is who human beings really are and thus they believe that they have and this is a this is a fine point but it's worth making they believe that they have the right to direct the spiritual evolution of man that's why they talk about developing the new man. That's why Herbert Marcuse writes in the 60s about finding a biological foundation for socialism. Their goal, the so-called new Soviet man or whatever they were going to generate, the new man, the reborn man, is in in the the full abstract, the idea is that they have the right because they know who human beings really are. They know who we secretly are on the inside. 
and therefore they have the right to redirect man back to what he always was meant to be. And imagine that you really believed that, how you would behave toward other people. <laughs> it's pretty much exactly the opposite of. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think everything. of. I'm trying to think of like um, a, a story that I've read recently, or a, or, a, or or something that would compare to that, um, that would ex illustrate that idea. Because I'm thinking it's not necessarily a blood right, blood bloodline thing. It's not the divine right of kings. It's not through genetics. No. It's through something else, and that I think that's what makes it more nefarious. Is because it can be translated from person to person without a simple genetic test. Oh, that's just, right. Yeah. You know, no, it's it's not. Um... It's not biological evolution, it's spiritual evolution. So it's the people who, as you put it earlier, the people who get it are on the mm -hmm. right side and the people who don't get it increasingly become the enemy of the people who do to the point where they eventually get framed as the enemies of humanity itself. And at that point, all that's left is to exterminate them really. So I've got this weird this this question that I'm sure I, I I hope you've answered somewhere before because I don't want it to be a new question I want it I actually want the answer more than the novelty of asking it but that idea is so anti intellectual this idea it, it is so fundamentally anti intellectual particularly like it's a category categorical um, uh, ad hominem it's essentially a categorical ad hominem but it's adopted in not the argument itself, but in the worldview that I am better than you, right? And, 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 and I am better than you because I know the current thing. And there's this, it, it, it's funny, I'm, I'm going to bring, I'm going to wrap Christianity into this because that is so antithetical to the way that even Christ talks in the New Testament or Paul otherwise is the goal is that I want you to believe the right thing. You are not good because you believe the right thing. And it's a, such a twisting of the scripture in a sense. Now, putting it in this question, the question I have for you is this idea that we are the enlightened. And, and I mean that in the enlightened in this Gnostic sense. Um, the people who have, as you described it, um, access to the a, a bio or an evolutionary right to the future of mankind, they, whatever it is, um, yeah. how does that, how does that take root in a system and an environment like the academies, which is, which solely is predicated on the antithesis of that, 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 that position? I don't know if that's another way of saying it. Right. Yeah. So I have been asked similar questions to this. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a unique way of having asked it. So, I mean, there are, I think there are a number of ways that this made its way into the academies, mm -hmm. uh, meaning academia. Uh, Shelby Steele, for example, puts forth a very compelling hypothesis in his book, White Guilt, where he explains that um, the moral sensibilities of primarily kind of university president types, university administrator types, and even faculty members in the 60s in the wake of the civil rights movement, when they kind of had this huge amount of um, realization that they probably had been complicit in, if not active participants in massive discrimination that was genuinely not just. And then they assuaged their guilt by basically being pushovers and allowing activists to come in and start kind of running departments. They created departments, the women's studies department that became gender studies, African-American studies departments that became ethnic studies, all sort of started in this milieu. In fact, the University of California system started as early as I think 67 or 69, I get the years mixed up a little bit, mandating uh, ethnic studies uh, as a as a course of study. And maybe they mandated it later and they initiated it in the 60s, but it's been a very long time in the coming. But this Shelby Steele's hypothesis that white guilt, that they tapped into a moral reservoir is a very compelling hypothesis. Another thing that happened in the 60s was actually the model that we all take for granted today of academic hiring and promotion and tenure. So academic careerism in general was all adopted really in the 60s, the, the so-called publisher parish model. Uh, the publisher parish model is based off of one thing in primary only, which is the proliferation of academic journals. A lot of people don't think about the relevance of the academic journals to the problem that we face with the universities having transformed themselves, but I think it's actually central, and it might be the central, like the reason why the universities went woke and became these woke seminaries uh, of, of a Gnostic cult. And the reason is 
you have to think about the economics. Who the hell wants to read an academic journal? Nobody. There's like what? It's a standing joke, right? That maybe eight people are going to read it, right? Or 10. Nobody reads these. So who, how do you, how do you print one? Well, it costs money to print one and it costs money to distribute it. Nobody buys it. So how in the world do you make money? How do you even cover your costs? How is this a profitable industry? And let me just tell you, it's an extraordinarily profitable industry. And a model was invented in the 1960s by which basically the academic journals, the major academic publishers started to grift off of the university library systems. University libraries were attached to university budgets, were often state budgets. And they could, they didn't really have any particularly highly accountable reason to save money. And so if a professor, they kind of cooked up a system where if a professor said that it was useful to their research to get a hold of an academic journal, then they could petition the library, the, usually just a piece of paper getting signed, the library would order the journal, the library would pay for it. The library was probably being, being funded primarily by the state, if it was a state university, but, but also by tuition and the other pathways of money that all universities have. And so in other words, you're still in this kind of third person socialistic buying situation. So the university libraries would buy them and then they started to sell in kind of lumps. So if you wanted to get all of the humanities journals that Taylor and Francis publishes, you could buy that as a big kind of conglomerate. Well, what this produces is the capacity to produce a bunch of journals that literally nobody wants. And in fact, what it produces is the capacity to produce fringe journals or even activist journals. Uh, if I wanted to say this is a real thing that actually happened, I read the book tracking its development. You know, there's a study of nutrition, right? Nutrition studies or um, dietetics or whatever. And the study of diet and nutrition, that's a real thing. Okay, so fine. That's, you know, not a very common academic thing, but it's in some universities. Well, let's say that I was a critical theorist, an activist, and I wanted to take that field over. And I see it's small and it's relatively ripe. All I have to do is start writing the papers, which is my business, and then conglomerate them into a small unofficial journal, have a conference or two, gather a couple of funders to bankroll like two small conferences at like a Marriott or something like that. Then I, or a, a university, if I can get one to host, it would even be better. Then I apply to Taylor and Francis or Sage or something like that to be able to get that journal picked up in their humanity suite. And if they say yes, and why wouldn't they? They have no particular reason not to. Out it goes into all the university libraries and they get paid for all of them. So there's this weird set of incentives. Well, what this does is it creates an outlet where publications became the primary way that people were decided as to whether or not they were competent academics. Now we come back to a point I made earlier. Do you know how damn easy it is to write these papers? You can write them every two weeks. You can just churn these things out. Turns out nobody ever reads them as we're learning from Harvard and other schools, so it's easy to plagiarize to get the job done faster. Mm -hmm. It turns out you can churn out this activist drivel, this theory-based humanities drivel, extremely fast. There's no breaks, you're making it up. And so what happens is you create a huge amount of incentive for people in those departments, they can produce tons of output. They can get, you know, picked up, not just as some faculty member now may, they, oh, look how many publications she has. Now she's a tenured professor. Well, let's set up a sub department of the English department for her. Let's just make it a full department a couple of years later. And you actually enable the entryism of ideology into the university. And because it's an intolerant ideology that forces renormalization around itself, that being part of its insurgency model, not just to disrupt the existing community, but to force renormalization around its values. Yeah, no, I, I have an example for you, but I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, well, go. once you have that, then you have a 30 year plan to transform the entire institution from within. In other words, it, it's a very simple, it's Charlie Munger, you know, uh, he just died. He was a Warren Buffett's business partner, you know, good guy, bad guy, who cares, knew how to make money for sure. And he said, you show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And the incentive structure for academia came to be that people that could publish drivel and the people who could renormalize a social structure around themselves of relatively weak people who wanted to get along and don't have a lot of friends are going to dominate. And over 50 years, they did. Yeah. So it's it's such an interesting issue with academia then, too, because you would think that um, if, if if the environment itself was so and this is going to sound denigrating, but to those who are listening, you know, who know who we are, I guess they'll understand it. But the amount of, let's say, men who want to get along in the academia and the academics in, in college, 
you would think that it would open up a perfect avenue of approach for let's just say strong men and i and i have a little bit of a <clears throat> i don't have a I'm not a fan of like the alpha beta sigma models or like strong men versus weak men models, whether even in even in a little bit to the some of the issues with like Nietzsche, or just again, it, it goes back into oppressors and oppressed and separating by kind. And it's like none of none of this none of this matters in my none of it. None of it fits with my worldview because so yeah, imago dei. Um, but I, I, I've seen it happen in academia in exactly that way, where you have, uh, I went to a generally conservative Christian school, and, and there was this slow, steady creep, except for we just got to watch it in real time while we were there, as new departments would gain more and more members who were always somehow in a certain worldview mindset. And the result of the school is that they were losing money, hand over fist. And I think they eventually got a new a new uh, president who did something that I was very excited for. Is he just fired them all? Yeah. Just you, 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 you. Just let like because uh, they they kind of went back to their roots and so. And I, I will see how it plays out. I don't think that's exactly the case, but it was an interesting response. Of eventually they caught wind of it and they started getting rid of the problem people who are instigating who gets into the school and mm -hmm. uh, and it, and, it, and it, 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 the optimism is, is is returned, which is kind of cool. Um, geez, so that's that's a lot of material that we've covered so far. I have my notes on the things that I wanted to actually talk to you about, and I think we've covered a whole bunch of them. So if you've got room for one more topic, I think I'd love to dive into that, and then we can yeah. call it a day. But thank you very much. You know, so uh, let me let me elaborate on that last point real quick, and then we'll we'll do one more. So one more topic. So. I want you because you think that it would open the door for strong people and this is a hopeful picture that you paint that some strong people will come in or men will come in and start firing the problem and we're seeing that with dei departments kind of nationwide florida just did it oklahoma's trying mm -hmm. um it's being talked about bas basically everywhere but you got to understand that with the model that i described that is the careerism model the incentive model of academic hiring tenure promotion endowment it, the whole thing the type of so-called strong person that it, it does not incentivize strong people it incentivizes uh liars and cheats how do we know that this is the case well look at the um there are two pr major problems in academic publishing uh one of they both have names and i only know one of the two names one of them is the replication crisis that we see in the social sciences so the replication crisis is that it's caused by misuse of various statistical techniques like p hacking it's caused by basically just cooking the books or giving fake data in order to get the result that you want. Why? Why is there? Why is it that the majority of results in the social sciences are not replicable? Well, the answer is because it is more valuable to the academics involved to lie and cheat to get the result because those results get them the job, the promotion, the tenure, the whatever it is that they're chasing than it is to be uh, scientists, frankly, or to be arbiters of the truth or pursuers of the truth. So the incentive structure is, uh, the, I should say, the existence of the replication crisis is showing us that the incentive structure is on publish or perish. It's not on do good science or perish. So you're, you're rewarding the wrong behavior. Then there's another similar phenomenon and I don't know what it's called, I know it has a name, where a scientist or a group of scientists, very frequently it's scientists who do this, um, will write a paper, say that they discover some novel behavior of a particular metal in material science or something like that. Sure. Okay, just some something that pops into my head, whatever. But rather than publishing this paper as a paper, they'll figure out a way to jimmy it so they can publish it as five papers in sequence. So the first part is a basically meaningless paper that just kind of introduces the idea. And the second paper does a little bit. And then it's like they're peeling back like the layers to, to tease out instead of just publishing a paper that says what they wanted to say that gets the result done. They figure out junk ways to turn it into five different papers that talk about five different things because they get rewarded for having five papers instead of just doing the job correctly in one. And th that has a name as well, but I forgot what the name of that problem is, but this is prolific throughout academia. So the incentive structure, what we see actually selects for the frankly assholes who do that. It doesn't select for strong men. It doesn't even select for weak men. It selects for 
activists and bullies and opportunists and people who take advantage of a, of a um, flawed, I will say, is the best way to put it, flawed incentive structure. Uh, the, pe the people who hate who hate the va the values will succeed the most in this environment. If the values are integrity and intellectual uh, or intellectual integrity and charity, then those who despise those traits will gain the most. So you have to. No, change when you sit down at a tenure committee, you can say, "Well, he did. He's he's got a really great character, and he's really committed to the science and the pursuit of truth." Or you can say, "Well, he published seven papers last year." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he published seven papers. Has anybody read them? No. Is any uh, ever <clears throat> ever going to read them? No. No, they have other tools for that, H indexes and impact <coughs> factors and so on. But mm -hmm. it it's still the 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 incentives are cooked to promote the wrong things, and the, the nature of the activist material is just so qualitatively different than rigorous material that it's the there's a natural tilting of the playing field on those incentives to those people. So if that I don't I don't I don't want to leave that subject on a black pill because I I think and I I I I I don't like having like a nihilistic conclusion to such things like this and one way one solution that's been suggested is, that I've seen maybe a little bit more in the abstract is just an alternative like a, an alternative school what Peter Bogosian's doing what Jordan Peterson might be talking about doing where you're going to see and this is not a new idea this is not a new idea at all there was a school in, a, there was a new a new of a school that was famous for having a seminary. Well, it got too woke, so all the the people who were responsible of the seminary left and started their own, mm -hmm. and then that one's successful in its own right. Yeah, and historically that's worked. So how is it's gonna is counterintuitive as it is? There seems to be this desperation, particularly amongst young men, for someone to give them permission to do the thing. Mm -hmm. Like go and start your own school, go write your own book, go do your own thing. Because as we realize that the gatekeepers or the, the, the those who hold the titles of the institution aren't even worthy of it, the president of Harvard is a massive plagiarist. The, um, the, you know, the, the, the Pulitzer Prize winners are basically illiterate. It doesn't mean that we throw out academia and we throw out writing and intelligence. Right. It means that you're you're not gonna give you will no longer this is the optimism that I have you're no longer gonna get away with being a bullshit artist. That's because, right. So no, all we have to say no to is the stupid credentials. It's not academia that we have to say no to in this case. It's the publishing model and the idea that academic careers should be based off of your publishing record as a primary. Uh, maybe the other measurements that we'd have to come up with to determine it would be different or difficult to come up with, but that would be something. Something that could clean up the replication crisis very, very quickly. I mean, this is very simple. This isn't some sexy, elegant, like, you know, it's not inspiring the young men to go start a new thing. But honest to God, if you just made it a degree requirement for a PhD in the social sciences that you have to um, attempt to replicate passing or failing, uh, you know, 10 studies that already exist, or you can't complete your degree. So you are, you are, it's not novel research, so maybe that's not enough to get your PhD, but as part of your PhD program, you have to take some of the famous results or some of the particular results, and you have to go do the experiment yourself and try to replicate it. Hmm. And if it can't be, so you could actually start finding which ones are replicable and which ones aren't very quickly and easily. Theoretical humanities, that problem can be nipped in the bud pretty extremely quickly by just considering that their their publications are not really a good measurement for for um, for pro promotion and tenure. Uh, yeah. John Haidt has suggested, in fact, that the activist domain and the truth pursuing domains of the universities divorce one another. So, you know, there's still a divinity school at Yale, but Yale is a proper modern university in the other sense. So you could actually separate this uh, I would call it a um, mysticism school, frankly, but they probably wouldn't agree to that. But you could you could separate these off, and if Yale still wants to have one, that's fine. But you can't get a bachelor's of science in it, or even a bachelor's of arts, because it's something else. You don't get a you don't get a master's of, of of science or arts in theology. You get an MDiv. You get a different designation of degree that says what you're actually you know getting a degree in. Well, imagine if you had to get like a master's a master's of mysticism or something like that. To go yeah. do gender studies like okay great like who wants to hire that nobody yeah well 
I think I think you're right on the I, I think the the acknowledging of it as a religion is is one of the most important parts because it then it, it, uh, it then it explains communism's destruction as a holy war. The same people who accuse the crusaders of going off into the east and killing their way eastward are now doing I do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's on on the on a grand scale. That's been a, a a replication not a replication but that's been a repeating theme that I've been observing for the better part of a decade. And you just have to realize one thing to realize that that's exactly what communism does. What mm -hmm. communism is concerned with is the future spiritual state of man. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. It's an eschatological faith. And so the war that it wages is is fundamentally religious. I, I, I might agree with you. I, no, I agree with you, even though I'm pro I might come from a different angle. And that is that um, I, I focus on the, I, th I think that, Hume's argument of the is ought divide is convincing that science deals with the is and then religion deals with the ought and everything that anything that informs your ought fundamentally is your religion. But that's, I don't know if that's Sure, I mean, we could go there, but it, the, the most, I mean, you're literally having to remake mankind as a new man in order to live a liberated life from the fall predicated by the existence of private property mm -hmm. and separation of one man from another is a type yeah. of social fall. And so, I mean, just the fact that it is concerned with man's eventual spiritual, in a social sense, inheritance uh, proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's a religion, or we could go to the Supreme Court definition of a, of a religion or the law, the, the, the First Amendment jurisprudence uh, definition, which is that it is a comprehensive system of belief and practice that answers fundamental questions about the world and man's role in it, such that it gives rise to duties of conscience. You don't even have to have a God or anything, and no, nothing of the, of the kind has to be invoked. It meets all three of those criteria just completely transparently. Yeah, I, I, from a broad spectrum, I'm actually somewhat optimistic because I'm seeing that return to, let's say, kind of a, if, if we're going to call that worldview classic, that definition of religion is classic. There seems to be a return to that away from yeah. the new the new atheism. It's just a bunch of people saying the same thing in a in a box. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Which is hypercritical um, on my end. So yeah, it was it was critical religion studies is what it was. Yeah, well, it didn't it's like it, critical race theory, but it's critical religion theory. That's what new atheism was. Yeah, well, it, it didn't seem to age well. I mean, no. But I don't. I think that 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 would become story time, and I, I don't really know if I want to go down that road. Um, so this is kind of the last, the well, the last thing that I have here that I was that I kind of I wanted to talk to you about it has to do with just war theory, mm -hmm. um, and in a in a sense, one of the challenges that we're facing from I'm not I'm not approaching you as a um, an expert in just war theory. By the way, I'm not I'm not trying yeah, I'm to, not. you know, it's not that's not the issue, but. You're, are you familiar with the, the kind of the basic sim division between juice ad bello and juice in bellum? Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. Um, the challenge that I think we're seeing a lot in the West right now, particularly, and that's a, not a very academic way of saying it, but the challenge that we're facing has to do with abstractions in regards to insurgencies, culture as an attack vector for war making, and intent. And the problem that you might run into is this is a, a metaphorical model where China as a country and as a government under a von Clausewitz sense, which is war can only be between governments, can en engage warlike catastrophe on the United States to alter its course without meeting the conditions that would con consider it war making, according to von Clausewitz. Mm -hmm. Classic insurgency is I'm going to go to war with you while remaining perpetually under the line, which justifies which meets jus ad bellum uh, requirements. In other, and it's almost like, in a sense, in the most notorious way, you play a game of capture the flag. There's a line in the middle of the field. If you cross the field, you're on their territory. If they tag you, you go to the jail or whatever. Well, it's the kid who stands at the line and he puts his toe across all the time, playing na na na, you can't get me, while somebody else is running over here raiding the hen house. Mm -hmm. um, so the issue, China then works with a non-state actor being a cartel to produce fentanyl to put that into the United States. And now America can't go to war against China because China's not doing it. Um, the cartels aren't a nation state, so they can't do it. They can't go to war against, the United States can't go to war against them. And then the 
people that the cartel are the are that China is attacking through a cartel through the use of fentanyl is not the government. It's not the it's not corruption with the president. It's not corruption in this environment. It's just killing the population and disrupting it. Evidence mm -hmm. being Minneapolis 2023 is a 2024 now is a hellhole in, in, in some sense, ideologies aside. Um, and then you have the death of George Floyd, which was caused by fentanyl. And now you have all of these activist groups that you can fund and support, and you can, and, 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 and in a sense, encourage to serve as antithetical to the values of the country. We don't believe in justice. We want social justice. We don't believe in the rights of the individual. We believe in the rights of the collective or whatever. And now the issue that we, we face in that sense is if I can, if I can, draw that whole thing up and I can somehow get it all together in writing, not just as a theory, but this man who works for this part of the government gave this money to this man did this money and do the intelligence work of identifying the financial, the paper trail and the act activities that were done. I still don't know what my juice in bellum right actions, right, right responses more or appropriate responses would be in most cases. And this is how I think insurgencies function in a micro scale in schools, in a macro scale on a nation state and in the even larger scale on our global issue. As culture particular is, particularly is the attack vector and they're exacerbating certain issues or, they can, or there is an ability for people to exacerbate specific issues for the sole purpose of changing the political atmosphere which you've referred to a little bit as entryism. We've also seen it as, uh, there's another word, but I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me. Now, this whole worldview, the problem is that we can establish intent. If we can establish intent, we still don't have the answer for what the rules of engagement are. What are the appropriate response tactics? And I'm wondering if you have any input on that, because we started talking about it a little bit earlier with the tactic being they film the response. The idea is the response. We want the response. And I want to, I want to kind of build from either the top, we've kind of, we've gone into the top of the theology level of the ideological argument. Now I want to go back down into some of the practical. And I'm wondering if we have a little bit, if you have, if, if that's something that's going to work out for you. I mean, we can try. <laughs> I know. And, and, and Cause these, I mean, these are very nearly intractable, intractable problems, at least in the sense of kind of the, uh, the, Legal is not the word I'm looking for, but um, sort of legal theories that we have as far as, you know, very clearly it's a, you know, we don't know what the rules of engagement are. We don't even know who to attack. We don't know who to arrest or, you know, whatever. The only thing that we could do with the fentanyl problem, really, there are only a handful of things that we could try to uh, say that we had evidence that the Chinese are are subsidizing it through the cartels. Well, we know that the Chinese and the cartels are both problems. We know that the we can, since the cartels are located in Mexico, we can make it a domestic issue for them. Donald Trump did that to some degree when he was president. Uh, basically, um, the way he did that was telling Mexico, you're going to clean up some of your cartel problem or else we're going to put crazy tariffs on you. Uh, and Mexico and basically told him we need you or you need us more than we need you. So uh, Mexico actually started to handle that problem internally somewhat. And then the infiltration of Chinese money actually gets passed down to Mexico in that rate. If we could connect the dots to China, we could also put pressure or sanctions on China. I think somebody like Trump would have the uh, nerve to attempt something like that. Uh, so I think that there are solutions to these, but they require, you know, as another term of art that gets thrown around with all this is fifth generational warfare um, uh, to kind of you know, paraphrase from the Chappelle show, modern, modern problems require modern solutions. And so it requires answering it with, uh, with, with the it's eff effectively tactics that are tailored to fight back in kind. Um, I think Trump was actually fairly successful, though scattered and um, resisted internally resisted on many of these points. And it would be interesting to see what a, a second and perhaps more focused administration might be able to accomplish. I don't think that these are unsolvable problems. I worry about other problems uh, more than that particular one, though that one's uh, rather enormous. I, I worry that we've allowed China to become the manufacturing base for the world. And then we've established these stupid business policies, these ESG policies in particular, that prevent us from being manufacturers. So let's say, for example, that the worst of the worst situations came to pass and we go to a hot war. 
right? So that's sort of your former domain. Do you realize, maybe you know this, this is a nifty little fact I picked up a year or so ago and I didn't believe it and I looked it up and it turns out that it's true. Um, so suppose we ended up in a hot war. Here's a problem. Do you know how many primary lead smelters exist in the United States of America? I don't know so, how many. The so let me was, clarify the, the what one, a smelter is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, a I primary lead answer, smelter but... can create metal lead from lead ore. So they can take some rock that has lead atoms in it and get the lead out and turn it into lead, which obviously becomes bullets, right? So that, that that's the war port. Turns out that the, the secondary lead smelter can take spent lead. It can take the junk that's inside of a car battery after it goes dead or whatever, and it can recover that lead. It's not exactly recycling because, say, in a car battery, it's chemically degraded into lead sulfate, but it's a secondary lead um lead smelter can recover lead from, you know, things like that, uh, and also can do re lead recycling. Turns out we do have some secondary lead smelters in the United States, but we have zero primary lead smelters in the United States. Not one, we have zero. The last one was in Tampa, Florida, and it closed down because of environmental policy or whatever uh, three or four years ago. And so we have zero capacity to make lead ourselves in the United States right now which means we have to buy our lead from somebody else, which, you know, in a perfectly harmonious and functioning world, maybe that's not a problem. Um, China is one of the major manufacturers of lead in the world today because they have no, no ecological standards whatsoever and making lead is toxic and dangerous. Uh, it's a dirty business. And so um, if we were to go to say World War III, it's safe to presume that the United States and China would likely not be on the same side of that war. It's less clear as to what side of the war California would join, but um, it's safe to assume that the United States and as a, as a whole and China would not be on the same side of the war. And uh, we're at some point going to hit the problem that we buy our bullets from China. Uh, okay. So these kinds of problems I am also deeply concerned about. So what I actually see on a global scale um more than the kind of disintegrated uh, asymmetrical warfare that we're talking about, I also see the problem that the West is intentionally committing suicide. Um, yes, okay. I, I, okay. Which, which is being exacerbated by those uh, destabilizing and demoralizing uh, political warfare tactics that we're seeing, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's the financing of ridiculous ideologies as interpretations for those things, whether it's the financing of DAs that make it so that our cities are, are you know, hellscapes, um, dangerous places to be. People, I mean, I just saw that the property values in, in Portland are down by over 40% or something like that. I mean, just this is insane, like commercial property values have bottomed out. So what we're looking at for Portland, Oregon is a future trajectory that looks a lot like the trajectory of Detroit coming out of the 1960s. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a section of Minneapolis that has not recovered and the, and the assessment, the, like the- I went to George Floyd Square in uh, November. Yeah. You should have called me. Oh wait, this last November? I wasn't yeah. there. I was there. They, people asked me what my security. They said you need security. I said I'm going at eight thirty in the morning. They said that's your security. You'll be fine. Yeah, and, like uh, like Jordan Peterson's idea. If you want, if you want the best students, just hold it in the morning because the lazy ones won't come. I mean, it's a solution. It's it's not a. Bad it is one. a solution. Um, yeah, I was on my way to the airport and I had a morning flight, so I just stopped by on my way to check it out. And man, it's it's it's, it's not it's good. A, it's an experience, and you got to see some of the scar, some of the place where you got to see yeah. uptown. Yeah. yeah, it's a it, uptown was once a very vibrant part of town, and now it's just buildings with closed down buildings and mm -hmm. creepy murals. But um, I don't want to get too. I don't, I, I, we're near the end of this part, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. so with the uh, the idea of the hot war with China and lead is one concern. Although I'm I, I I'm not a metallurgist. However, smelting lead is not the most difficult thing. I think right. it comes. I think it comes down to. Um, environmental issues in the United States, like how it long is. would it, right. how, how long would it take to get a lead smelter? Also, you have we'd have to ask the question of how much of our war making with China would participate with small arms fire, and how many of those are even using lead core? Because if you're familiar with what the military is using for ammunition, even out of an M4 or 5.56 or whatever, we're not using a lot of lead in the same way. Now it still has its necessity and it's still its own place, but when it comes to heavyweight munitions and 
artillery and drones and all that kind of stuff. Lead isn't certainly a priority. Not a, not a super important metal. But but there are other concerns too. Like, do you know how many um, uh, gunpowder plants there are in the United States? Probably zero or one. There's like one or two. I mean, it depends yeah. on who you ask. But it's there's not there's not a lot. Like, where do where do so much where does so much of our where does our our, our, our resources for that the base resources that go into gunpowder is very difficult very regulated and then beyond that it goes even into the i think there's 13 chemicals that go into a primer and mm -hmm. we we purchase most of those from china and those yeah, are going to be continued issues so this is where i this is where this is the white pill which is going to start sound this is the this is the op optimistic we are already in world war three we are i agree we are because the the nuclear bomb set a cap on what conventional warfare could achieve in our in our, in our ability to perceive now could it get bigger sure maybe we'll have space lasers but the point is is that the atom bomb hiroshima and nagasaki and then the mass armament of the cold war set sort of a ceiling on what conventional war would look like which created the festering underground by which insurgency could exist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now like any war there are people who participate and there are people who are casualties Casualties are those who are not necessarily participants. They're not belligerents. But that's getting gray because of fifth generation warfare. When you ask somebody who's like coming from a military school about fifth generation warfare, they'll probably roll their eyes. For as, whereas for yourself, you've brought it up. Tim Pool's brought it up. What do you mean by fifth generation warfare? Or the fifth I, generation? Largely, it's insurgent warfare. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm borrowing the term. The, per the I think the first person I heard use it in a very clear sense with a clear definition was Robert Malone, just to okay. specify who I heard talking about it. And he kind of laid out what's first generation, what's second generation. Third generation is this sort of very clear, you know, battle lines engagement, blah, blah, blah. Fourth generation warfare is actually kind of more guerrilla warfare. It looks a lot like uh, Vietnam. And then fifth generation is this, um, heavy political means, you, you know, you may not even see any, uh, any kinetic fighting whatsoever. Um, but it's largely insurgency tactics to get, to foment revolution, to foment, uh, civic unrest and destabilization of populations to then move in and take advantage of that either with a decisive stroke through the military or through a decisive economic or political move. Um, and De are you using decisive as in like a von Clausewitz decisive, like a decisive battle? Like it is written in legislation, therefore we won kind of thing. How are you I using mean, it? I'm being much more loose than that. But okay. when I said decisive battle, that's kind of what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so the United States gets so destabilized and they whatever. You could just imagine a situation and it goes into civil war or whatever. Some stupid thing happens. And then China makes its move and starts taking over territory. Um, makes a deal with Canada, comes across the northern border and actually secures and supplants our government. That would be very decisive in the von Clausewitz kind of yeah. uh, portrait. I'm, I'm... That's not impossible, but I don't think that that's the, the goal. Actually, I think like you said before with the definition of insurgency, the goal is to make it stay that the war, they, they want it to feel like anybody who says there's a war going on like you just did is crazy. Uh, it's always just one notch below the full level of engagement. Uh, that mm -hmm. people would undeniably say, oh yeah, we're at war. Because I agree with you. I've been saying we've been in World War III for uh, a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, or at least the gray edges of it. But like, Because sure. this also goes back to like Strassau generation theory. That uh -huh. it, it, it's all, the bad times are always tomorrow. It's always going to make strong men tomorrow. Like, no, 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 no. The, the bad times started in 2020, man. It's It's been rough for a while. Like this yeah. isn't, we're not... Let's let's not let's not be so pessimistic about our worldview, thinking that oh it's going to get so much worse. Like it's pretty bad right now, dude. If you go out into your streets and you see people like dying in the hordes of of overdose, like we have human trafficking operations running amok in the United States right now. It's we're not exactly in a great time. We just haven't. That's right. We haven't come to terms with it, but it, it might be the gray edges, and it could get worse. But um, kind of pulling back and closing in that one, or kind of pulling back on that one. Um, 
The issue with it is, I think, and I think the issue then, though, is that the right primarily thinks of warfare in a binary of von Clausewitz. We are either at war or we are not at war, which is mm -hmm. the problem of the decisive battles, because you have your Waterloo, then we're done, and then we go home, and we all talk to each other, and then we all figure it out again. Well, that doesn't work anymore, and the left, the left primary view, worldview of warfare is either a gradient scale or it's Maoist. It's like it can range everything from total genocide to um, insurgency conflicts, but they're committed all the time, yeah. and and that's what if that's if that helps in in my worldview. The issue that I run, I think the issue that I, I run into with people, and this actually is going to be a, a contrast. When I the issue with the conspiracy theory conspiracy theorist as well as the perpetual apocalypse is tomorrow kind of guy is that both both worldviews produce a sense of urgency which assuages the sense of guilt or uh, the the kind of malaise of imminence in a mm -hmm, sense mm -hmm. and so the the belief in the worldview of the t tomorrow the apocalypse is going to happen oftentimes is a method of soothing the pain of, a, of of what you might call a meaningless life yeah 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 uh have sure. you that's something that i've observed and and i think the problem that i, I i'm looking at is in your solution i think you prov i think you provided a solution there is, is kind of what i'm saying is is the perpetuality of warfare is that we are justified in living in our own country and holding our values which some people refer to as nationalism but I'm not even going down that far. Yeah, right. Um, I'm not. Uh, the terms nationalism is, is is we don't have time to cover it. It's today. fraught. It's yeah. so yeah. And um, cool. I don't. That's not the strongest conclusion I wanted to make. No, no, no. But there is a white pill here because we'll we'll riff off of and let the let the guys at, at you know war school roll their eyes. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll we'll riff off a of fifth generational warfare. Okay, so let's just hypothesize. This is going to sound utterly stupid but i swear to god that i'm i'm onto something here and let them think it through if fifth generational warfare is this kind of insurgent thing where you know you've got not just not just the the kind of civil unrest and the divisive politics and the political warfare activities but you got the chinese funding some actor that's connected to the cartel and then the cartel is delivering the drug and then the you know some other entity is paying for the identity politics that play off of the catastrophe of the drug and then you've got this idiocy where you know you've got these environmental regulations that are causing the west to commit suicide environmental social regulations through the esg policies and you don't really know who you're fighting so this is a fifth generational warfare at the world scale the global scale milieu what's sixth generational warfare which in theory beats it right if we just kind of think of this in a very kind of linear kind of this is just riff with me because we're just playing and i honest to god i think it's memes I think that the, what, the thing that these evil bastards haven't been able to keep up with is memes. Memes communicate a level of information, but they also communicate a level of uh, um, unseriousness that actually undermines their ability. If you especially look at these suits, right, the guys at like the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, it's so easy to turn them into laughing stocks. It's so easy. And, and if their tactic is to so all this kind of crazy division in the population or to, to, you know, manipulate circumstances to their advantage that they can then mobilize in the population, like releasing a virus and then creating a pandemic out of the fact of the virus that became a huge public health uh, power grab and transfer of wealth. Look at what, look at the situation that memes have now put us in. We are now in the situation to where we can, can communicate them and mock this thing in real time as it's being rolled out. Like they can't even roll it out in phases and get ahead of us anymore. Within hours, we're already making jokes. We're already making memes. We're already putting stuff out. We're already communicating levels of truth, but more importantly of distrust. And we have reached a point right now. I make this comment a lot and it's a silly comment, but imagine like right now, this is what happened. You have a window open in your house for whatever reason and a bird flies in and it poops on your desk and it flies out and you get infected with some new novel bird flu that's really bad and you don't realize it and you spread it to five or six people later today and then the bird flu breaks out and it was like literally a bird flew in your window, right? What would bird happen? Flu. So a month from now, we've got, you know, whatever H2N2 or whatever the numbers are, the H's and N's mean specific things and you can look that up and it's really actually fascinating. But you've got some new bird flu 
and it's really bad and it's the new pandemic. Oh my God. But we know it came from a bird that flew into your window. It doesn't matter. The world is going to blame the United Nations and the World Economic Forum for this to the point where like people are going to get like blasted out of their jobs. Like this is going to be, you're going to talk about a farmer's revolt, like burning down the EU over a bird crapping on your desk because we're that attenuated now to their stupid attempts to manipulate us. We don't know everything that's going on. We're not always right, but our because of this environment, meme warfare has put us in an environment where we actually have an upper hand on their nudge theory, their manipulative tools, their um, their their messaging apparatus. You know, sometimes they call it the vertically integrated messaging apparatus, where the institutions, the politicians, the media at all levels all start saying the same thing at the same time. So it just kind of becomes true uh, in a fake way. Uh, we've got tools that actually nullify and, and defeat a lot of that. We didn't have those tools in 2020. That's why we got rolled. We had memes, but they were just jokes. But now we have some really savvy, deep cutting political memes. That's why they had to put that guy in a couple of guys. They put a couple of guys in jail for making memes about one of them was for Hillary Clinton with the election. It's because they realized the power of, of, of just this novel form of communication that communicates a fairly large amount of information. But more importantly, what it does is it cuts through the mystification. They have a paragraph of text that's trying to explain to you why you're supposed to feel about a thing a certain way. And then you've got this one picture of SpongeBob that tells you why you get to laugh at the whole paragraph, right? And it's actually, since most of what we're loosely calling fifth generational warfare is psychological warfare, is taking place in people's heads, Memes uh, yeah. become a weapon that cuts across that like like a hypersonic missile. I mean, it's like a game-changing level. Yeah. And that's why they have to try to censor the internet, which then becomes its own meme and defeats them even further. Yeah. So there's a massive white... This sounds all dumb, but the point is it's a massive white pill. Well, yeah, actually, you're touching on something that, that like, when I went to... When I was in uni the university, my I, I, I had a history minor. My minor in history was on the French Revolution. And instead of us getting our, you know, our little cafes where we all talk about important details and then go off and do stuff, we have memes, which is not exactly encouraging. I'm kind of like, oh, I, I wanted the aesthetic with like the wood and the cool, but no, nah, we get this instead. Um, maybe a little less guillotines, but we're good with that. However, there's, a, I think there's an important point here that you're, you've talked about, I've been writing about, and I want to see if it connects. And that is... Um, it's not di disregarding the issue, right? So the issue, the, the, essentially it's disregard. It's we are sorting between bad actors and good actors and bad conversation and good conversation in a different way because now that the internet is out and that genie can't be put in the bottle, we have access to so much information that the evaluation of information has to change and it's getting distilled down into a, you know, epistemological pillars of, well, if it comes from the World Economic Forum, then it's almost guaranteed to be fallacious or something like that, which sounds, which in older times would be a fallacy in itself. But the challenge that we're, I think we're dealing with and or the, the advantage that we're getting is decentralization, that your authority as the WHO is not going to affect my life. I'm That's right. Put, I'm going to put up barriers because I no longer I'll recognize the legitimacy of your claim to any form of authority in this regard. And it's simply the where I think the good news is of it, where I think the the strength of it comes out of in our population is that it's not so much that people are waking up to the system. I've always hated that language of all oh, people just need to wake up like they're not going to dude. They're going to they're never going to do that because your definition of waking up is so vague and specific at the same time. It doesn't mean anything. But rather, it's that we are witnessing the dissolution of the authority systems in real time. Yeah. As people are saying, yeah, no thanks. I don't want yeah. to. I don't want to. I don't want to participate in your game anymore, and we don't have to. And I think that's where the. I think that's where the outlet goes. Is it's decentralization. It's yeah. it's it's no longer pursuit. It's no longer. We no longer in it, live in an environment where you get to just get away with getting along. You have yeah. to actually stand on something. And that form. I, I did a podcast about this a, a while back called "Welcome to the Second Enlightenment," 
And um, the argument that I make is that, in a sense, what we might refer to kind of generically as the information economy. We talk about the so-called marketplace of ideas, but I argue that the marketplace of ideas has not existed and is just now emerging. Um, Interesting. Prior to this, what we've had actually is an aristocracy of ideas. Prior to that, we had a magisterium of ideas um, and, and kind of this sort of you know, it's a little bit of a rift off of Marx's, you know, linear trajectory of history. Uh, but the magisterium of ideas gave way through what we called the first enlightenment to an aristocracy where experts and journalists and professors would be the ones and priests, but less priests would be the ones who have the authoritative grip on knowledge because people could read so they could read what the aristocracy produced. They didn't have to rely on the magisterium to tell them moment to moment and they could make up their own minds, but there was still an aristocracy. There were still the opinion makers. And then all of a sudden with the internet, we've entered into this zone of uh, information, kind of the information universe where people can do their own research. It's not that the average person can learn to read and pick up what they want. It's actually that I just compared it in my own life to how much harder it was to do academic research before the internet versus now. Um, yeah, I, I don't even think about it. If I want to go learn something or my wife who isn't an academic in any way wants to go learn something, we don't blink. We just get on our phone or we get on our laptop. And over the course of the next, you know, few days or few weeks, we can become relatively expert in some, you know, branch of, of knowledge. Whereas before, I remember as a kid having to go to the public library, search around, try to find what books they had, find out they didn't have the kind of book that I might need or read through and find I need this source. So you have to go get an interlibrary loan to borrow a book from somewhere else. And that revolves a six week process or whatever for them to mail it back in the 80s or 90s. People could not do their own research on most meaningful topics. Now they can do their own research on most meaningful topics, which is, again, why they're trying to censor the Internet, because the aristocrats who run what boils down to knowledge plantations don't want to have to give up their farms. But turns out we're not serfs anymore. We can do our own research. And I think it's literally like the transition from economic feudalism or mercantilism into um, capitalism, as we call it, or free enterprise is being mirrored in the information economy uh, right now. And the fire of this enlightenment is not going to burn out. They're going to fight like hell to keep their plantations. But history has shown that every such, every such turn has gone the same way. I, I, I think that's a great white pill to end on. And so next, if we ever get to have another conversation, we'll start on, on moral injury, because that's, I think, the, I think that's the weapon that's being used in your fifth generation warfare. Yeah, I think you're right. You're right. Partic part, like, and particularly PTSD consists of, in simplicity, two different idea, two different problems. You've got the physiological issues, trauma to the brain, chemical imbalance, and then you have the moral injury. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we expected everyone to treat it with chemical and now we're trying to deal with the other one but it doesn't mean that we can't deliberately inflict moral injury on people and uh, that that is exactly what i think is happening in the west right now is that yeah that's being, a fabulous way to put it we are being subjected to a never-ending series of moral injuries don't believe your lying eyes don't believe you know it's 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 you're going to kill grandmother you're an evil human being because you're an evil white racist uh, yeah. What is a white world rage and the leaders of academia are telling you that you're evil for being where you're from and who you are. And so I think it, it will get into that on another time if the opportunity arises. But I got to respect your time. Got to let you go. Thank you very much for this conversation, James. Um, is there any way could you please plug how best for people to follow you? Yeah, for sure. So if you want to follow my work, which I'll point to you first, go to my website, which is called New Discourses. The website is newdiscourses.com. And so you can find my podcasts, my essays, what else I've got going on in the world, uh, especially I've got a bunch of books. I got a new book I'm plugging, so I'll plug it right now. It's called The Queering of the American Child. It's about how queer theory got into education. Um, I think that's a very important topic. It's not what we talked about today. Uh, you can find that either on newdiscourses.com or we gave it its own landing page, which is queeringbook.com. And you can follow me on social media so long as they let me stay there at Conceptual James. Um, I'm not on Facebook because they've already not let me stay there. I made a meme. They kicked me off for life. There it is. But you're uh, you're on, on X or 
formerly Twitter. Yeah, the for, the artist formerly known as Twitter. I am quite notorious there. I did get kicked off for life on that, but the Elon resurrected my account, and uh, I even con- I even finally caved in and bought his stupid blue check. Uh, so does that if you're off Facebook, does that mean you're off uh, Instagram as well? No, I'm on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why they're managed differently. I am on Instagram uh, at Conceptual James there as well. Um, and I have a blue they they verified me in the same I think the same week that Facebook permanently banned me. So you know, go figure that that is hilarious. Um, I have uh, I have a, a not conspiracy theory about Twitter. Or I'm sorry about Instagram's management because. Uh, as if they can't figure out if they're trying to become only fans or or something else but we'll let that for another day so well james it's been a pleasure thank you very much for joining the show and thank you for having a, a conversation on a number of topics that i that ha- i have been looking forward to for a long time so thank you much uh and we will talk to you soon so if you have anything else we're gonna close i'm good thank you all right go forth and conquer